to start off by giving all praise, glory, and honor to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem Rakakwadash. The name of the Heavenly Father, who the world calls God, is Yahweh. Bahashem, in the name of His only begotten Son, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ, Yahweh Shah Hamashiach. Bahashem, in the name of Rahakwadash, which is the Holy Spirit. And uh, today is going to be a uh, lesson uh, based off John 3.16. And um, I've talked about this previously in past videos um, that I was going to do a brief lesson on this. So this is not going to be too long. We're going to get straight to the point. And um, Lord willing, you're edified. So to give you the simple breakdown of what the verse John 3.16 in terms of what it's actually talking about, um, you have to understand, as I always bring out in um, videos that I do to help spread, you know, this ministry, you know, starting with the apostles and elders on down, um, and you other Akiums out there spreading this word and truth in all sincerity, is that you have to know the history, and the Bible is nothing more than a 110% uh, truth of historical evidence historical facts all right it is not just a it is not a religious book okay it is a historical book based off one nation of people who was given the law statutes and commandments and that is the nation of israel pertaining to the 12 tribes who are israelites all right which consist of you so-called negroes latinos and native americans of today all right now we're going to read the verse, and then I'm going to break it down, and Lord willing, you guys are edified. Now, this is John 3.16. We're reading it out of the King James Version, and it reads, and I'm going to read this verbatim. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, the first thing we have to break down is, according to Isaiah, well, let's get it, 28th chapter, this is how you break down the scriptures. This is Isaiah, the 28th chapter, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And that word he is talking about the Heavenly Father, whose name is Yahweh. And whom shall he, meaning Yahweh, make to understand doctrine? What is the doctrine that's trying to be understood here? It's this word, the truth. Okay? Let's lock you. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Now, what it says, weaned from the milk, is talking about being renewed. And as you're coming into this truth, you're getting the basic understanding as when a baby is born. It is nurtured, nurtured through his mother's breast milk, getting the, uh, you know, nutrition that it needs. OK, getting the basic foundation of life. That's what it means to be weaned from the milk. You're getting the basic understanding. All right. Here's the point. In order to understand doctrine, in order for the most high to teach knowledge, knowledge, Salakia, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line line upon line, here a little and there a little. So we have to read the scriptures based off precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and in there a little. You might read a verse here, and in order to break that verse down, you may have to jump two to three books ahead, whether that be in the Old Testament, the Apocrypha, or the New Testament, to gain a little bit of understanding. So we want to use what the Most High told us to do in order to break John 3.16 down. Now, the first thing we have to do is we need to get the context to find out that word world. Okay, it says, for God so loved the world. Now, the problem here is when you read that in today's uh, standard English, you take that as face value. When it says the world, you assume that everybody within this within this planet earth 
you know, that's the world, right? So what we need to do is we need to go up a couple of verses to gain a proper understanding and to gain some context to this verse. So we're going to go up and jump to, um, we're going to start at verse 13. This is John 3 and 13, and it says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So let's pause right there and try to gain some context to what is being said. So now it's said that, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of, a, of man be lifted up. So let's go to cross-reference, which is another way of uh, saying precepts. And let's go back through history to find out what Moses had to do for the serpent to be lifted up. All right. So we're going to jump to Numbers 21 and 7. And we're going to start at the sixth verse. This is the bronze serpent, all right? And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. He's talking about Israel. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord. And against thee, pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. So to give you a general idea to you simple, you know, Jake's out there. This was during a time when the Israelites were coming out of, uh, out of the wilderness. And um, they were, you know, in the wilderness. And basically when the Most High gave the word from on high, to Moses to prophesy and speak to the people and what they must do before they pass into the land of Canaan, which today is known as Israel, right? They kept going off. They were they kept sinning, okay? They was breaking the covenant. So the Most High lit their ass up with these serpents, basically, all right? Uh, verse 8, and it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So the Most High told Moses to make a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, you know, and then it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So verse 9, and Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass, exactly as the Most High said, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So that was, how can I say, that was their way to look towards for something. That was nothing but a shadow of things to come. Because now the people um, were going to be given something much greater than, than that serpent. And that person today is Yahweh Shai, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ. So now we got the context of who it was talking about, okay? So the people who it was talking about was Israel, okay? And please keep this in mind. We're getting a context. So this has nothing to do with the other nations because the other nations were not given the covenant at that uh, at that time, nor were they given a covenant, uh, uh, nor were they given the new covenant, Salaki, I should say, um, that... Yahweh Shah came on earth uh, to establish, and Lord willing, we'll get that. So now let's go back and reread. Okay, this is John 3 and 14. And, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, because the children of Israel were in the wilderness, okay, before they crossed over to the land of Canaan, okay, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, okay, but have eternal life. Now, before I reread that, let's go back again, because this is where a lot of the Christian churches misinterpret the scriptures, and they have no basic understanding, because they don't understand history. 
I'm going to read Numbers 21 and 8 again for context. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Two key words, shall live. Now, if we go back, let's read that John 3 and 15. That, so like, I'm going to start at 14 again. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Same thing as shall live. Okay, now let's get to the point. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believing in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, when you don't read it in context like that, and we use the precept of Numbers 21 to go back into history to gain an understanding of what it's talking about, if, you're, if you go to a so-called church today, whether you're Orthodox, Christian, uh, Evangelist, uh, Catholic, doesn't matter. If you're just hearing the pastor or the preacher just read this verbatim, this will go right over your head because you have no knowledge and you have no history. So now what we have to do, there's a lot of meat in this scripture. We have to break it down. So the first thing we want to do is we want to look up where it says, for God so loved the world. What is that world? What does the world mean? We have to look that up. Okay. So we're going to go to the Strong's Concordance, which is here. Strong's G2889 says here Cosmos. So let's get the proper understanding. Strong's G2889, Cosmos. Cosmos. Right. Says here, an apt and harmonious, harmonious, uh, harmonious arrangement, Salakia, or constitution, order, government, okay? That's what it is. Now, you got to be careful when you read these, de uh, these definitions because, you know, Esau pretty much took our scriptures and pretty much, you know, downplay it to the point where he added and, and take it away certain things. To try to throw you off okay but all um but with all of that being said these two definitions right here an apt and harmonious arrangement or constitution order government ornament decoration adornment i.e example the arrangement of the stars the heavenly hosts as the ornament of heavens uh referring to as um First Peter three and three, right? So now we know, and then if it goes down, it says the world of the universe. But it's talking about an apt and harmonious arrangement, okay? A harmonious arrangement or constitution, order, government. Key word, government, which is singular, not plural. When you look at the planet today, you have many governments, right? This is talking about one government, all right? So now we know when we go back and read, okay, and this is how you do it. When you go back to that verse, for God so loved the world, cosmos, meaning that harmonious arrangement, that order, that government that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now we have to grab another precept for that world. Who's the world? Who, who is that harmonious arrangement government? Okay, that adornment. Let's go to Isaiah again, the 45th chapter, to find out who that world is. Okay. Uh, actually, you know what? Now we're going to skip, we're going to go to uh, Hebrews, the first chapter, because what you have, guys have to understand, the Most High Son, Yahweh Shai, was set up <laughs> to create many worlds. This is the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 1. And it says here, I'm just reading it verbatim. God, who at sun-dry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. 
Verse two, here's the point. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he, meaning Yahweh Shah, made the worlds. See that? Worlds. Plural. Okay? Plural. Because let's grab a precept to that. Spelt that wrong. Salakia. All right. This is John 14 and 2. In my father's house, this is Yahweh Shah speaking. In my father's house are many mansions. Key word, mansions, plural. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. Okay? We're, we're breaking down the verse. Okay? Now we're gaining context. We're going precept upon precept, line, per, uh, line upon line. Okay? So we know that the Father, who is Yahweh, has many mansions. Okay? Let's grab another precept because you have to dig deep in order to gain an understanding of Yahweh Shah creating the world. So he's, he's not only created earth, but there's other cosmos, there's other uh, worlds out there, right? So let's grab another precept. Uh, all right, this is Acts 7 chapter, verse 49. Heaven is my throne. And earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, said the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Okay, so he's letting you know that if heaven is his throne, where his throne is, and the earth is his footstool. But when you go to John 14, where it says that when Yahweh Shah said that my father has many mansions. Okay, it's talking about that. He this, this is not the only place. All right. This is the, the earth is not the end all be all. There are many mansions in the father's house. If, if we being the planet, being the planet Earth are the father, the heavenly father, uh, Yahweh, Bahashem Yahweh Shah's footstool. <laughs> OK, that should tell you when you when you stretch out the heavens above the firmament of the earth. That, you know, that's why they say the galaxy, it, it, it just goes on forever, forever. You, you, you can't measure the universe, right? So now we got an understanding of that, right? So going back to Hebrews 1, all right, verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, Yahweh Shai, whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. Now, we have to go and find out. Because there's many worlds that Yahweh Shah made, which world did he love? Okay, who was the world to uh, the Heavenly Father through Yahweh Shah? Now we're going to go to Isaiah, the 45th chapter. We're using precept upon precept, line upon line. We're going to jump down to the 17th verse. All right. But Israel, okay, key word, but Israel. Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. See that? World without end. Israel is the world. It didn't say the, um, you know, everybody in the whole entire universe on the planet Earth or everybody in the planet Earth is the world unto the Lord. No, Israel shall be saved and Israel world is the world without end. Okay, you understand that? Now, why is Israel the world without end? Let's get another precept to back this up. Let's go to Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter. Okay. This is Deuteronomy 7 and 6. For thou art an holy people. Two key words, holy people. 
unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen, okay, singular, chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, okay, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Do you start, are you starting to, to see the picture now? This is how you read the Bible. Precept upon precept, breaking the scriptures down, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Okay, we started at John, the book of John, chapter three. And then we went back into the Old Testament to Numbers to get the history when Moses lifted up the serpent back to John to read it in context. Then we jumped over to Hebrews to find out the worlds that is, that is more than one world, uh, according to the scriptures. Right. Then we jumped to Acts to find to, uh, only to find out that even through those worlds that the father, Yahweh, Yahweh Shah has many mansions because heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. So this helps you to gain a proper understanding in great detail in the context of what we're dealing here, because um, going back to John three sixteen, I'm going to come back to this scripture here, Deuteronomy, and I'm just going through the spirit. You know, I just want to take my time so you guys can get this breakdown. When it says for God so loved the world, we know that that word world through the Greek is cosmos, which stands for an harmonious arrangement of a government. OK, we're going to dig deeper. All right. So going back to Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, where it talked about uh, Israel was the chosen nation. They were chosen to be a special people unto the Lord himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So when it says all people, everyone else who is not Israel, who is not an Israelite, the Israelites were considered to be above everybody else on the planet all right let's get another precept to that uh, let's see through cross references i believe it's in the book of uh peter all right let's see just bear with me basically let me type it in Yep, here it is, 1 Peter 2 and 9. Okay, Apostle Peter said this, but ye are a chosen generation. This is another precept to Deuteronomy 7 and 6. A royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvel marvelous light. So wait a minute. Now we start to get, get an understanding when we go back to John 3.16. Okay. We'll go back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now let's go ahead and finish this and close this out. I'm going to bring it all home because there's a lot of meat left in this verse. So we figured out that the world that the Most High was talking about was Israel, pertaining to Isaiah 45 and verse 17, world without end. But then it goes on to say that he gave his only begotten son. Why did he give his only begotten son? Because if you remember going up to verse 14, where it says, and Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, which we read back in Numbers, the 21st uh, chapter. And it says, even so must the son of man be lifted up because you guys have to understand Israel went off and they sinned. They were the only nation that has sinned against the heavenly father because they were the only nation given the law, statutes and commandments. And to prove that, we're going to go to Psalms. Uh, the 147th chapter. OK, this is the book of Psalms 147, verse 19. He, meaning Yahweh, OK, Yahweh Bashem, Yahweh Shai, showeth his word. What's the word? 
this truth, the law, statutes, and commandments unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Jacob being the Jews, uh, Judah, Levi, Benjamin, Israel being the rest of the 10, uh, ten tribes, okay, which are Israelites. Verse 20, he hath not dealt so with any nation. Two key words, any nation. And as far as his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. So now we've just established that Israel was the only nation upon the face of the whole earth, apart from every other nation of people that was given a law, statutes and commandments. That's why when you go into the New Testament, a lot of Christians stumble at the fact that they think when the Messiah came on the scene, he died for everyone that uh, Israel was pretty much done away. And that's not true. Israel was never done away. And we can get that in, I think, Romans, the 11th chapter. Yeah, this is Romans 11 and 1. Here it is here. Israel is not cast away. I say then, this is Apostle Paul, hath the Most High cast away his people? Because who was his people? Deuteronomy 7 and 6, 2 P uh, 1 Peter 2 and 9. Israel was chosen as a holy nation above all people. I say then, hath the Most High cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. You see that? You see that? So let's go back to John 3.16 because we still have a few more bases to cover. All right. Because like I said, there's a lot more meat in that verse to break down. So we got the understanding that the world is talking about the world of Israel. We got the understanding that he gave his only begotten son, which was Yahweh Shai, just like how he gave Moses that serpent. Now, Yahweh Shai replaced that serpent because when the children of Israel back in the ancient world and under um, Moses, because uh, at that time, Moses was the intercession between the Most High and the children. Right. And Moses was just doing everything the Most High told him. And we got to keep that in mind. And when the children of Israel was looking up to that serpent, what did it say? They shall live. But watch what it says here. OK, that whosoever. Now we know that now we know who that whosoever is. It's not talking about anybody. It's talking about whosoever within the world of Israel, because Israel were still getting bitten by the serpents. OK, and what do I mean? They were getting bitten by the serpents because they were sent. The Israel still today is going off. They're sinning. They're not keeping the law, statutes and commandments. OK, that whosoever in the world of Israel Believeth on him, meaning Yahweh Shah, the son, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Or if we go back to Numbers 21, shall live. Okay? Now you can understand. But now, we got, I want to go back to uh, Hebrews, the first chapter, because I want to break this uh, word down. Let's go look up that word, uh, worlds. Let's see what it's talking about. G-165, Ion. 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 Let's see what it says. It says here, forever and unbroken age, perpetuity of time, eternity, the worlds. There it is again, plural, universe, period of time, age. Okay? It says here in the Strong's definition, properly in age by extension, perpetuity also past. By implication, the world, especially Jewish, a messianic period, present or future, age, course, eternal. You see that? It's going right into the, uh, the it's basically all about Israel, the world of Israel, okay? And this is what you have to understand, all right? Because um, with Israel being a holy nation, Okay, they were going to be set up to get the kingdom. And let's get that. All right. But the saints, 
Okay? Daniel 7 and 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Why is that? Well, let's get, let me see, is it in Revelation 1 and 6, I think it is. This is, uh, yeah, this is the book of Revelation, chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 5. And from Yahawashah Hamashiach, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loveth us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Who was us? Who Whose sins did he wash? Let's grab another precept. Let's go to Acts, the fifth chapter. We're going to start at the 30th verse. This is Acts 5 and 30. The God of our fathers raised up Yahweh, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him had the Most High exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. All right. So when you go back to Revelation 5. And from Yahweh Hamashiach, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins. It's talking about the sins of the Israelites. All right. Here's the point. Verse six. And hath made us kings and priests unto the most high and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Did we not just read in Daniel 7 and 18 that the. Uh, that the saints should possess the kingdom. Now, going back, who are the saints? Okay, because some people think that the saints is anybody who believes in so-called Jesus Christ. The scriptures tells you who the saints are. Let's get Psalms 148. It could be Psalms 147. Let's see. Yep. This is Psalms 148. We're going to start at 13. Let them praise the name of the Lord Yahweh, Bahashem Yahweh Shai, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and, and heaven. Slakia. Verse 14. Here's the point. He also exalted the horn of his people, being Israel. We read that in Deuteronomy 7 and 6 and 1 Peter 2 and 9. The praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord, Yahweh Bashem, Yahweh Shai. You see that? And we're just using precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Okay? That's all we're doing. So when you go to Revelation chapter 1 again let me see if I can grab a precept let's see what they got in the precepts it is yep 5 and 10 revelations 5 and 10 let me see now show you something let's start at 9 it's the book of revelations chapter 5 verse 9 and they sung a new song Okay, we're singing a new song now. We're calling upon the name of Yahweh through his son, Yahweh Shai, which is the true name of the Heavenly Father and the Son, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to the Most High by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now, to prove Let's look up that word. Let's see if I can find it. Kindred. Strong's G, 5443. Foulet. 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 Let's see what the Strong's definition for kindred says. A tribe in the NT, meaning New Testament, all the persons descending from one of the 12 sons of the patriarch Jacob 
In other words, the 12 tribes of Israel. So when you go back and read that verse, when it says, verse 9, and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, many Yahweh shy, and hast redeemed us to the Most High by thy blood out of every kindred, meaning out of every tribe. And when it says in tongue, it's talking about the languages. Why? Because it goes on in people and nation because all the 12 tribes were scattered. Okay? They were scattered. And here's the point. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on earth. Why? Because going back to Dan Daniel, the seventh chapter, precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, to gain proper context and understanding. But the saints, which we read in uh, Psalms 148, is talking about the children of Israel of the Most High shall take the kingdom. No, we ain't going to sit up there and ask. We're going to take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So when we go back to John 3.16, Let's bring it home. Okay. For the most high so loved the world of Israel that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay. And this is why when Yahweh Shai came on the scene, you had a lot of the Pharisees and scribes. They had issues with him pertaining to the doctrine that he was bringing. Because it contradicted what they believed in. They they wholeheartedly was carnal, meaning that they were uh, relying on fleshly uh, matters that couldn't profit uh, the soul. They were so focused on the Mosaic laws that when Yahweh shot came, you know, he told them, like, I am the way now. All right. What Moses from uh, through Yahweh brought in Exodus, the 20th chapter, was a shadow of things to come for us. Now, I said earlier in the video that I was going to get into uh, the new covenant, right? So let's get that. Let's see what the new covenant is for. And we'll end it uh, off that. Oh, boy, I can't spell. Still can't spell. Hold on. There we go. That looks right. All right. So now let's get Jeremiah chapter 31 and, and 31. Yeah, we'll start at 31. Now we're going to go into the new covenant. Now this is prophecy that has yet to come to pass, but it's going to happen very soon. And we're praying through Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai that he hurry up and shortens the days for the elect's sake. So that we can establish the new covenant. All right. We're in the period of grace. We're not in the new covenant. And you're about to see right now. This is the book of Jeremiah 31 and 31. Behold, the days come, said Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Let's stop there. Where in this verse did it say that he was going to make a covenant with the whole world? Because this is where you get, this is where the confusion comes when you are a part of religion. Religion is man-made. The Bible is not a religious book. It is a historical book that follows the journey from the past up until this present time containing or concerning the 12 tribes of Israel, the Israelites, All right? Verse 32, not according to to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. The Israelites broke the first covenant. They kept going off. They sinned. Although I was a husband unto them, said Yahweh, because um, Israel is known as Zion, Yasharala, uh, Yash, meaning prince. Okay. Allah, um, many power, all right? Prince of power, okay? Um, and the, the, the and, um, Zion, which is all the 12 tribes, is like unto a woman. We're like, uh, we're like the bride of the Most High. We're practically married to him when we took the covenant. 
That's why it calls it um, spiritual fornication, because when you go off worshiping these other gods, right? When you go worshiping these other guys, we cheated on the most high. We can we committed adultery. OK, verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Again, singular, singular nation of people, Israel. Not everybody is Israel on a whole planet Earth. After those days, said the Lord, Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts. Let me read that sentence again. After those days. OK, meaning when it's all said and done. Said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their power and they shall be my people. Which tells you that the law was never done away with, because if the if the commandments and the law was done away with, why is he making a new covenant to put the law uh, into the inward parts is to ensure that Israel never goes off again. Because does not John, let's take a, a quick precept tour. Let's get John 14. One of my favorite scriptures. And let me put this on so you guys can see that I'm not BSing. This is in the red letter. This is what Yahweh Shah said. This is a Mashiach. John 14 and 15. 15, it's like it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. I say, I say this all the time in my videos. The law, statutes, and commandments were never done away with. All right? Not to digress. Just wanted to make that point real quick. Going back to Jeremiah, we'll read uh, 33 again. And it says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their power and they should be my people. Here's the point, verse 34. This will tell you if we are in a new covenant now or not. And they shall teach no more. Let me read it again. And they, meaning Israel, shall teach no more. Every man his neighbor and every man his brother. The neighbor is talking about the uh, Israelite foreigners. Okay, it's talking about all Israel because why? All throughout the Bible, Israel had prophets. They had prophets that were set up to make Israel be in remembrance to the covenant, the first covenant. Every prophet from the beginning of uh, the Torah, Moses' first five books. Okay, you have all the big prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel. Okay, they all kept warning Israel to stay on course and to keep the law, statutes, and commandments. All right. It says here, no more Israel shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, said the Lord Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This has not happened yet because you see the brothers, the, the apostles and elders on down and you see this gospel being preached across the four corners of the earth, which means Israel is still being taught to repent and to return to Yahweh Shem Yahweh Shai, which lets you know this prophecy has not come to pass yet. Let's let's get another precept. Now, that was the Old Testament. We're going to find the same um, scripture preset in the New Testament. Hebrews 8 and 9. We might have to read up a verse. We'll start at verse 8. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not 
in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. All right. So when we go back to John 316. For God so loved the world. We know that that world now cosmos and harmonious arrangement government is talking about Israel, the world of Israel. We know that there's more than one world. OK, so like we know that there's more than one world There's multiple or many worlds out there. And we know that the heavenly father has mansions. OK, plural, more than one. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we'll get this last precept and we'll close it here. Uh, we'll get Acts, the 13th chapter. Oh, I cannot spell tonight. Sorry about that. Um, 13. One of my all time favorite scriptures, I think it's Acts 13 and 24. All right, this is, we'll start at verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Verse 23, of this man's seed hath the most high, according to his promise, raised unto Israel, a savior. Israel, notice it said Israel, it didn't say any other nation. He raised unto Israel a savior. That savior name was Yahweh Shai, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ. Because we read earlier in Psalms 147, the word, the law, statutes, and commandments was only giving, given to Israel. It wasn't given to no other nation. So how can the other nations partake into the new covenant when they were never give, uh, when they were never given the first covenant? Do you guys see that? And this is how you gain a proper understanding of the Bible. Reading precept upon precept. Here's the point. Verse 24. When John, and it's talking about John the Baptist, had first preached before his coming, before whose coming? Yahweh Shah's coming. The baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So if you a so-called Christian out there, if you a so-called pastor or preacher or whatever, I would love for you to break down that scripture to me and explain to me why is it saying that John was teaching the repentance to the house of Israel. He wasn't teaching the repentance to everybody. And the reason why everybody could not come into the fold of the adoption was because the law, statutes, and commandments, that first covenant was only given to the house of Israel. And we can go even deeper than that. Let's go to um, Matthew. Let's see what it is. Matthew. Um, the Mm, yeah, 15 chapter. And I brought this out in the last video. So this is the, uh, the Seraphonician woman. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Seraphonician woman... That Yahweh Shah was talking about, she was an actual Israelite woman. And Lord willing, I can make a lesson out of that to go deeper into that. But uh, the Most High, through Yahweh Shah, wasn't going to come on the scene and give the good news, which is the gospel, to all other kingdoms on the earth. So it says here, then Yahweh Shah went thence and departed into the coasts. Of Tyre and Sidon, because in Tyre and Sidon, you had Israelites scattered in that region. 
and the only way you'll get this understanding is by reading the scriptures, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, because it was prophesied that Israel was going to be scattered across the four winds. Verse 22, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him. Now, when it says Canaan, to give you a modern perspective, as I said, it was Israelites living in that region, but you had people who didn't know that they were Israelites or who knew that they were Israelites, but because they lived in that region, they were called by whatever that region name. So you may have like um, Italians, but then them living in America, they are known as Italian Americans or they'll just call themselves American. Most of the time, they'll be known as Italian Americans and vice versa, right? Same thing with Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, does he not tell you in Romans the 11th chapter that he's from the tribe of Benjamin? He's an Israelite. But there's also in an account written in his epistle where he actually uh, says that he is a Roman citizen. We'll come back to this. Let's get that precept. Just to prove a point. Spelling it wrong. I think I am. Actually, hold on. Not nah, here it is here. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, we'll just start at Acts verse 25. So Acts 22 and 25 says, When they tied Paul, talking about Apostle Paul, down to lash him, Paul said to the officer standing there, Is it legal for you to whip a Roman citizen who hasn't even been tried so what is he talking about here let's go on and finish reading it says verse 26 when an officer heard this he went to the commander and asked what are you doing this man is a roman citizen verse 27 so the commander went over and asked paul tell me are you a roman citizen <laughs> and paul's reply was yes i certainly am but wait a minute Let's go back to Romans, the 11th chapter. It says here, I ask, then has the Most High rejected his people, the nation of Israel. You see that? Israel was the Most High's people. Nobody else, the Most High didn't give a rat's ass about any other nation people. You know what? I'm going to get that scripture too. All right. I'm just in the spirit to bring this out. It says, I ask, then has the Most High rejected his people, the nation of Israel? Of course not. This is in a new uh, NLT. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. He just told us that he's an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin. But when he was, let's go back to the King James Version. When he was tried, go back to Acts 22nd chapter, right around the 27th verse. When he was tried, I'll put it back in uh, NLT so we can read it. Clear understanding. When he was being tried, the commander says here, so the commander went over and asked Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I certainly am. So when we go back to Matthew, the 15th chapter. That Seraphonician woman, that Canaan woman, she was an actual, um, she was an Israelite living in Canaan. So they would call themselves Canaan. Just like you had Israelites living in uh, Greece under the Greek captivity, they were calling themselves Greek. That's the reason why Paul was commissioned to speak to the Gentiles, the Greeks. That's why he said it's neither Jew nor Greek. He was talking about the Israelites. I didn't brought I didn't went into the apartment and brought that scripture out I don't know how many times. And people still want to act ignorant to the fact that they're still talking about all people. Well, if it's fucking talking about neither Jew nor Greek, what about the damn Chinese? What about the no Jew, no Greek, no Chinese, no Jew, no Greek, no Japanese, no Jew, no Greek, no Italians, no Jew, no Greek, no East Indians, no Jew, no Greek, no Arabs. Why is it only talking about no Jew, no Greek? Because 
the Israelites were put in what's called a Hellenistes, or uh, they were Hellenized. Meaning they were forced to follow the ordinances of the Greeks. But not to digress, that's a whole nother uh, lesson within itself. So let's get back to the um, to the topic at hand. So then Yahweh Shah went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Now, how would she know? That that is the son of David, because remember, we read in Psalms that the word was shown unto Jacob in the statutes and in, in the law, statutes, commandments unto Israel. And it tell, and does it not tell you all throughout Deuteronomy to teach the ordinances to the children from generation upon generation? So that's why I told you, you have many Israelites scattered across different nations. Some knew that they were Israelites and others didn't because they fell away. And when they were mixed in with the heathen, they took on the heathen uh, custom. So a lot of them didn't grow up within the law, statute, of commandments. That's why you had Pharisees arguing with uh, Peter and Paul about the grafting in of the Gentiles because th the Jews who did grow up in the law, statute, of commandments, when they came encounter with the other Israelites who didn't grow in, in, in the customs and they were going off eating pork worshiping false idols and everything they didn't want to have shit to do with them they looked down upon them and that's the reason why in the scripture uh paul said you know when uh he tried to reason with them that they they didn't even want to hear it from paul so that's why he said that's why the uh roughly paraphrasing that's why the uh word is going to the gentiles because they accepted it but let's get back to the point. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Verse 23, but he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she cried after us. Here's the point. So like you, verse 24, but he answered and said, this is Yahweh shine his own words. I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, ladies and gentlemen, Akwats and Akyams out there, Yahweh Shai was not sent to be a savior to the whole world. He was only sent to be a savior unto the house of Israel. So, that is the proper breakdown of John 3.16. And I do apologize, um... Because I actually wanted this video, believe it or not, to be no more than 15 minutes long. But the spirit was on me to bring uh, to go further into depth with it um, because I, it's very important um, to know the true um, doctrine, to get the true understanding. So I'm going to leave it at there. This, we're approaching an hour. Um, I think that I think the point has been made. I want to give all praise, glory, and honor once again to our heavenly father, Yahweh, by Hashem, Yahweh Shai, by Hashem, Rakakwadash. Uh, Shalom to the apostles and elders on down Preaching this word and truth across the four winds of the planet earth Shalom to the elect out there Scattered across the four corners of the earth And Shalom to the la large multitude of women, men, and children Who the Lord will have mercy on in the day of Jacob's trouble Alright This is your brother uh, Tribe of Judah 144 on the YouTube channel To you I say Shalom